Yeah, so um, I'm mainly here today to share with you some of the global trends in workplace gender equality. What we have seen working and not working in workplaces around the world. And uh, one of the things that we have seen is that gender equality in the workplace is largely considered an art. Everybody has an opinion on that. Everybody is a specialist on that. But gender equality in the workplace, it's a science. It's a very precise workforce analytic science. So this is why we base our analysis on this fundamental principle of what gets measured gets done, running a certification system, measuring where organizations stand in terms of gender balance, pay equity, effectiveness of policies and practices to ensure equitable career flows, and inclusiveness of the culture of the organization as perceived by men and women working in the organization. And a second uh, aspect that we have uncovered uh, in working with the ES certification since 2009, we work with organizations around uh, 40, in 46 different countries, 22 different industries from for-profit uh, organizations uh, to organizations such as the World Bank or the uh, major development banks, central banks, uh, parts of governments uh, in different places, is that we also have a lot of assumptions when it comes to gender equality in the workplace. So my role today is to take you through some of the assumptions and hopefully shake some of the assumptions off. And the first assumption uh, that makes us have repeatedly this conversation and saying, yes, it makes sense. Yes, the data shows that diverse uh, teams do perform better, but we are still talking about it. And yes, it was 2016, and it's 2017, and it will be 2018, and we will probably still be talking about this. One of these major assumptions is that our organizations are meritocracies, right? We say that in the workplace. It's a meritocracy. The best person for the job gets the promotion. We say it in academia. It's a meritocracy the best person will get the tenure. We have this belief that we are able to recognize talent no matter under which form and each which circumstances that talent is presented to us. We have a sixth sense. We have a talent sixth sense. And we will be able to recognize that and we will be able to reward it. Correct? Then let me show you something. Wrong clicker. This is a video that was filmed one January cold morning in Washington, D.C., in a subway station. What you see here is a street artist in a corner playing a violin. And as you can see, it's rush hour. We all have things to do. People don't necessarily stop, aren't they? People are coming, going. Nobody's really listening. Nobody's really stopping to, um, to, to, to see you know, who the artist is, what the artist is playing. You will tell me, well, this is absolutely normal. What was special about this morning in DC is that all these people passing by were part of an unknown experiment to test exactly that. Are we really able to recognize talent? Because this artist that you see here is not just another artist. This artist is Joshua Bell. Joshua Bell is one of the most famous violin uh, uh, musicians in the world. And guess what? What do you think his violin is? That violin in the underground in DC. That violin there. What do you think his instrument is? It's an 18th century Stradivarius. Joshua Bell was there for 43 minutes playing one of the most wonderful, elegant pieces of classical music ever written.
on the finest instrument ever produced in the world by one of the most skilled artists. 1,100 people passed by. Seven stopped, of which a three-year-old boy. How much money do you think Joshua made that morning? $5. Oh, better than that, 35. And one person you see there recognized him. One person out of the 1,100 people that passed by. So let me repeat that. One of the finest musicians playing one of the most, actually there were seven most wonderful pieces of classical music on the most fantastic instrument. Seven stopped, one recognized him. And why? Because this is how we are used to see him. This is how we are used to see him performing. In a concert hall, dressed like you see him, not with a baseball cap. And we are told, you know, this is Joshua Bell. So he is one of the finest musicians in the world. And some of the people that passed by without acknowledging him were just two days ago paying $350 to listen to him in the concert hall in DC. So here we have the proof. When we think that we are able to recognize talent in its more unusual forms, this is simply not the truth. We are, we are very used to spontaneously recognize the type of talent that we are the most exposed with. That is one of the main assumptions. And to get you through the remaining uh, set of assumptions, we will be doing a quiz together. So I will be showing you a set of questions, questioning these assumptions of what we think is going on in the workplace. And I would like you to vote. And we will be voting by a show of hands. So. My first question to you is 75% of big company CEOs say that they are committed to gender equality in the workplace as a strategic priority for their organization. What is the percentage of the employees working for these organizations and these CEOs that you think believe that this statement is true? Please show me one finger if you think it's 80% Two fingers if you think it's 60%, and three fingers if you think it's less than 50%. Please cast your votes. You are a very educated audience. Well, unfortunately, objective and educated, because data shows <laughs> that indeed, less than 50% of the employees working for those organizations whose CEO is openly committed to gender equality as a strategic priority believe this is true. And even more worryingly so, only a third view it as a top priority for their direct manager. And that's one of the second main reasons why we are not making progress. Let's continue. On policies and practices, which one of the following policies and practices you believe it's absolutely vital, indispensable, to drive workplace gender equality? One, flexibility. Two, active management of pay equity. Three, awareness training against gender biases. Please cast your votes, one, two, or three. I see some twos, I see some ones, and the answer is active management of pay equity. It starts there. Pay people that have equivalent personal characteristics, equal amounts of money for performing an equivalent job. Let's continue. What do you think is the most important accelerator when it comes to women's career? One, leadership development training. Two, mentoring and sponsorship. Three, stretch assignments, career critical assignments. One, two, or three. Please cast your votes. I see a lot of twos. And the answer is, 
stretch assignments. Who works on that very visible, important project for the organization? On that research project that has the potential to be published in that very famous public publication? Who gets staffed on that very important client work that help people develop beyond their current potential? It's stretch assignments. And um, this is something that is substantiated by one of our distinguished academic advisors, Professor Hermina Ibarra. Uh, she works for INSEAD, who very often talks about this 70-20-10 model in saying who we are as professionals is the result of 70% what we learn on the job. 20% we acquire through critical relations at work. And of course, mentoring and sponsorship is part of it. 10% through formal education, which coming from somebody who represents a formal education institution is quite a sobering statement, but 70, 20, 10. This is not to say that those mentoring and sponsorship, that those formal trainings do not matter, but they are not alone. They are not able to create change. In the absence of this exposure to these critical assignments, to these critical projects, no mentoring and sponsorship, no leadership development training will get us there. I will read you the following statement and then you will tell me if you think this is true or false. Both men and women tend to be promoted exclusively based on a proven track record of past achievement and outstanding performances. True or false? One or two? As I said, very educated audience. It is false because women tend to be promoted on past performances. Men tend to be promoted on potential. And the reality is that this is how we should all be promoted on potential because we are promoted into something that is new for us, right? That we never did before. So the past achievements might or not, might not be uh, such a strong indication of what we will be able to do in a completely new role. So, you know, taking risks with new talent, it is essential. On the reasons to leave, what do you think is the top reason why women leave the company? One, lack of opportunities for advancement. Two, Work-life issues. Three, male-dominated work environment. Four, not feeling valued. One, two, three, or four. Please cast your votes. And the answer is not feeling valued. But what do they say when they leave? Work-life issues, right? Which just reinforces the myth of, yeah, you know, they are opting out, they are slowing down. But the real reason that we have unveiled in our qualitative research is that their contribution, both in terms of qualitative contribution they bring to the table, as well as the quantitative one, pay, uh, it's, it's, it's not uh, the type of, uh, it's not equally valued and not equally respected. Now, when we move to men, what is the top reason why men leave a company or an organization? Better opportunities elsewhere, not feeling valued, new work experience, work-life issues, one, two, or th three, or four. No doubts about that one. Better opportunities elsewhere. But there is a very important growing trend, which again we have seen across the globe in the 46 countries where we work, the work-life issue starts to be more and more increasingly so one of the reasons why men start to leave organizations. And this is a very, very encouraging trend. Which leads me to the wrap up. Because we talked about men and what men can do uh, in order to support women's career. And I would like to use a quote from a distinguished academic. Her name is Rosabeth Moss Cantor from the Harvard uh, Business School. 
And she said, well, I'm often asked, what can men do to advance women's career? And she says, my answer is simple, the laundry. Thank you very much. <laughs>and the more flexible tasks. So for example, who picks up the kids from school? This is a very inflexible task because you have to be there when the school finishes. Who does the groceries and who does the laundry? The cooking is a little bit in between because you have to eat at a certain moment, but there is more flexibility embedded to that. If you do it now or in a half an hour, uh, the, chain, the, the world will not change. Uh, and what we have seen is that even in these countries that have a, a much more balanced uh, distribution of the paid and unpaid work, the unflexible task still mm. seem to shift towards women, and mm. the more flexible unpaid work uh, still goes to men. So we have still room for improvement. That's a question back. Oh, we, oh, uh, you, did you want another? You want to ask another question? I thought you were handing off the microphone. Uh, first of Please. all, I would like to thank you for this very interesting presentation. Tell us who you are. Too. Uh, I'm Gülsün Salamer. I'm the former rector of Istanbul Technical University. So uh, you have given us a lot of information, and you shared your, you know, uh, results of your data with us. Uh, we know the facts now, but what would be the steps or strategies for improvement? Have you created any, you know, alternatives for different cases, how to, uh, you know, overcome the challenges and difficulties in our lives in order to reach our goals and to have better positions uh, in our workplaces and so on? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. I think that there are three major components to that. No matter which approach you take, it has to be systematic, it has to be structured, and it has to be iterative. So we have created that kind of system with a certification system, right? Which is based on clear, objectively measurable facts that are externally verified, so that there is an, uh, a third eye which brings the rigor into saying, well, you know, what you are thinking you do, it's actually what you do. And the certifications not being granted for a limited period of time, they ensure that this topic becomes top of the mind of the organization on a regular basis. So you invest in doing some activities, then you measure their impact and then you continue, you fine tune, and then you measure again. So I would say that no matter what specific routes you are following, as long as they are systematic, as long as they are structured and ingrained in objective evidence, and as long as they are repetitive, and then you have the perseverance to, to, to see the results coming, I think that's very important. Because one of the things that we have seen is that there is a tendency to throw money at the problem. So, you know, in the diversity world, there are fashion trends, right? Like everywhere. So there was a big fashion trend at a certain moment of mentoring, of sponsorship, of gender bias training, and they all work, but only if they address a very specific issue that exists in your organization that you have diagnosed properly, so you know what to expect out of these measures that you implement, you know, rather than throwing money at the problem. And then to, to stick to that long enough, so not to follow the next, the next season's fashion trend, but just to give yourself the time to implement those, to see the results appearing before moving on to the, to the next thing. Thank you. Back in the corner. 
It always baffled me that this couldn't be done, done just like all organizational change management, right? You put an objective in place and like was said earlier today, you reward and you penalize based on performance against the targets. Hi, Hilde Janssens, ISD Austria and trainer as well. Uh, thank you, I thought your talk was really, really insightful. A, a question regarding the laundry statement. Um, the, so there is like the unpaid hours, right? That, that, that might not be equal, but there's still a distinction when you say flexible versus non-flexible ta uh, task. The other thing, what I've heard a lot lately is the mental load like the whole organizational part. It's not like actually picking up the kids, but it's like arranging it all, so, and then thinking of like, oh, and I still have to do this on the way home, and buy a pair of shoes, and pick this up there, and is there any data like more clear? Because it seems, anecdotally, that this falls also more on the mother than the father. Do you have any data on that? Which makes uh, working mothers phenomenal project managers yes, in the absolutely. workplace. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> So I think that, unfortunately, we do not have enough evidence to study how the paid and unpaid work uh, is, is being distributed in such level of detail. What I think that this statement wants to signal is that in the last decade, we put a lot of effort into getting women to do more paid work, right? So that is one one pressure point. What we are trying to say here is that that's one, but while encouraging women to do more paid work, we need to encourage men to do more of the unpaid work, we need to encourage women to do less of the unpaid work, and we need to encourage men to do less of the paid work. So there are these four Absolutely. pressure points, right? So we started with the get them to do more paid work because you have to start somewhere. Now you see, it's, it's really it's so encouraging. We see so many companies in the private sector coming with paid paternity leave in equal lengths as the maternity leave. So, you know, the second, this, the second pressure point, get them to do more of the unpaid work. And I think the rest win, will unfold as long as we have the bigger picture in mind and we don't forget about the whole, the, the whole situation. I totally agree, thank you. I think there was some recent re uh, research that you might look up uh, stress load on women. Um, I see now the invisible workload that drags women down. There is increasingly, I think, a body of academic research around this very question. Here's a question. You probably planned more to do that to be able to come here than the actual planning you did. <laughs> To be here, right? <laughs> I know the feeling. Hi, thank you. That was fantastic. A really lovely, insightful, and real research. I Please think that introduce was fantastic. yourself. Sorry. Please. Emma Tolhurst. Um, I come from Accenture. I work with Payal, and I head up employer brand for Accenture across EMEA. Mm -hmm. um, my comment was going to be I've been away for five days, and I left my mother, my husband, my three children, and my dog, <laughs> and a spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> And that is how I run my life. Um, but actually, in more serious tone, we have just recently in the UK and Ireland uh, launched some, a paternity policy. Um, and there was an interesting reaction to it in our business. We have very favourable maternity uh, leave, which is fantastic. You can take up to a year and then you can have unpaid leave after that. Um, and I, of course, have stayed with the company. I've been with the company for 20 years in multiple roles and I have stayed with them for those policies. <clears throat> but what I was interested in when we launched the policy uh, was the response from women um, and men, but particularly women, about the fact that there was a change in the policy and therefore they may not get so much time out with their new child. Um, and then also the reaction by men, which was, oh, I shouldn't take paternity because it will impact in a negative way, it will impact my career and progression. But the encouraging view, I think, that we have seen is that very quickly we had a few role models and to the point earlier that was raised around media and how can we, um, how can we be, make people more aware of these positive changes. There was some strong media we delivered around the paternity policy and some great role models of men who work in really difficult areas of the business taking uh, taking paternity leave because their wives were either in a startup company or had a, a really good career that they wanted to go back to quickly. 
And what we've seen is quite a big uptick in people taking. So we reached 100 men, um, I think, within the, and pay, I'll have to go back, but I think it was within the net first eight months. Um, and I just think that, that for me, encouraged so many other men to say, okay, well, these, these, these men are MDs, they're senior in our organization, and they have had huge, huge amounts of positive response from the broader employee population as well. And it's actually enhanced their career when they came back in. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say that, completely agree. I have one small question to add, which is if we are educating women, or if we're looking to educate women in how they can become leaders, um, how would they feel valued, how can we help men to accept as well um, that perhaps do we need to do some training around those skill sets at home and the unpaid work? Because I often find men say, well, I can't cook. I really don't know how to do it. It frightens me. Or, or, you know, well, I can't do the laundry, I don't know how to use the washing machine. My husband does know how to use the washing machine. <laughs> and that's a, role model. that's a very interesting point. Because one of the things that we have, um, that we have found in our work with organizations is that actually everything that is counter-stereotypical in the workplace, it's taxed very heavily. So we are used to look at when women become counter-stereotypical. But what we have seen is that we have started to talk with men, so we're really creating a safe space for conversation with men, who told us the following thing. I think it was four years ago when I heard the first time this, when they said, you know, women who have children are seen as working mothers in the workplace. Men who have children are not seen as working fathers in the no. workplace. And the fact that we are not even seen as working fathers, mm -hmm. it cancels out a whole series of programs, practices that we do not feel entitled to even apply. And in our research, you remember that we look also at pay equity. We are so very used to see pay inequities in this favor of women. Mm -hmm. There is one situation where we constantly find pay equity in this favor of men. What do you think that is? Part-time contracts. Mm -hmm. Because we come again to the same thing. I mean, we are talking in terms of gender, but the reality is that companies have a model of what they consider a productive and committed worker. Whoever deviates from that model pays the price. We are very used that women deviate from that model. Oh, they will go on the baby track, they come back from maternity, they will want to go into a support function, all that. So we kind of, you know, we kind of, there is a price to play which is there, but we kind of used with that. When a man who is the unusual suspect does that, the perceived degrees of deviance from the normal are even higher. So the price to pay, it's higher. So I think that this is where gender equality in the workplace comes such an interesting behavioral science, because it is how do we tease out and how do we hear those employees that are in counter-stereotypical roles, because what are we really trying to achieve here? We are trying to make sure that the experiences of each one of us are individualized in the workplace. I'm a woman, I don't want to have a family, I want to have a phenomenal career, I want to be the CEO of this company, bam, I have the right to do it. I'm a man, I want to be a working father, I want to work 60% for the next five years, and I can do that without paying the price. This is what we are really looking here. How do we create that workplace where we can have those individualized experiences rather than stereotypical ones? Thank you. Wonderful. Well